begging please again I need you oh I need you walking down these desert roads water for my thirsty soul I need you oh I need you your forgiveness is like sweet sweet honey on my lips like the sound of a symphony to my ears like holy water on my to the riverside take me under baptize I need you oh God I need you your forgiveness is like sweet sweet honey on my lips like the sound of a symphony to my ears like Every day, it's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever me want to change. No, I don't want to abuse your ways. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Like holy water, your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips, like the sound of a symphony to my You 
night's day in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. places I will call. Incline your ear to me anew, and hear my cry for mercy. Were you to count my sinful ways, how could I come before your throne? meets my gaze I stand redeemed by grace alone I will wait for you I will wait for you on your word I will rely I will wait for you surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied So put your hope in God alone, take courage in his power to save, completely and forever one, by Christ emerging from the grave. I will wait for you, I will wait for you, on your word I will Now he has come to make a way, and God himself has paid the price. Trust in him today, find healing in his sacrifice. I will wait for you, I will wait for you, through the storm and through the night. I will wait for you, surely wait for you, for your love is my divine. I will wait for you. Jesus, we just thank you and praise you, and we're so grateful that you are worthy of our praise, and so we give it all to you today. Lord, we thank you for your brand new mercies every morning. We thank you that you are faithful to us when we are not faithful to you. 
we thank you that you have made a way for humanity to have relationship with a holy and righteous father through the blood shed on the cross. Lord, we thank you that you give us redemption through that blood. We pray, Holy Spirit, that this morning you would open up our hearts and our minds to your truth revealed through your word. We thank you that you meet us here, and we pray that we would go away a little bit different, ready to be your vessels, to be your hands and feet, to be light and salt to those who would come. We lift up your name, we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, happy, beautiful Sunday to y'all. Man, what a perfect Southern Oregon weekend. And congrats to all the dads that showed up, even in spite of their wives being gone at the women's retreat this weekend. I know the struggle is real. Uh, don't, 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 don't judge my family, or I should say my kids and I, if we're looking a little disheveled this morning. Uh, a lot of cool stuff going on, and I just want to take a minute to talk about it. You guys probably noticed there's, there's a table out in the lobby, and it is Compassion Sunday. And on this table are a number of cards with kiddos' names and a little bit about them. This is Purity from Uganda. It has her birthday and tells you how long she's been waiting for a sponsor. Purity has been waiting for 180 days. Compassion is one of the ministries we support as a church body. I know many of you support it individually, but if you're interested, and I would encourage you to be interested, man, stop by the table after church. Take a look, see if there's a child there that just catches your eye. Uh, see if the Holy Spirit is maybe stirring you to support a child in another country that does not have the opportunities, both tangible opportunities or opportunities to hear the gospel like we do here. And I can tell you, compassion is one that meets practical needs like medication, like food, shelter, protection, things like that. And they're also completely unashamed to declare the gospel to these little kiddos. So it's not just help for the sake of help. It is help for the sake of sharing the gospel. So I think that's pretty cool here. Uh, also, just a couple studies that are coming up. Next Sunday, we're going to be going over Jesus' Olivet Discourse, um, which is this uh, eschatological, or, or it's a prophecy about things to come that Jesus is declaring. And we're not going to go a mile deep next Sunday morning, but for those of you that are really interested, and I hope you're all interested, because this is, this is pretty important stuff about when Jesus may return, when Jesus will return, the question is when, not if. Uh, man, I hope we're interested in that. So next Sunday at 4 o'clock, we're going to go a mile deep on that one. That's 4 o'clock here at the church. Also, we have a new study on Revelation for the Women's Friday Morning Bible Study. If you're interested in that, connect with Kelly Waterhouse. I tell you to connect with Kelly, although she's on the women's retreat right now. So connect with her next week when you come, or just mark that on your calendars. Um, man, as, as Orion shared, we're going chapter by chapter through the Bible right now. Right now we find ourselves in Matthew 23. And if you know me even at all, you would probably guess that this would not be a chapter that I would just pick to teach on. I am forced to teach on this chapter this morning in spite of all of my predispositions and blind spots. This is not where I would choose to be. And so that's what, kind of what I love about going chapter by chapter is it forces us to teach on the things that we would not normally teach on, either because we don't care about them, or it, or it maybe opens up, like, like the word promises to do, soul and spirit, joints and marrow, some things in our own life that really can be quite convicting. And so I want to live in a bit of a tension this morning. I'm going to start it off on, on actually a conversation I had Thursday afternoon, and I want, I want us to live in some tension this morning. And this tension is we're not going to be Pharisees. We cannot be Pharisees. And yet that does not mean we become Herodians. And if you guys were here with us and we discussed those two, man, these Pharisees were hyper-concerned about every little aspect of the law and not just the law, but the oral tradition that they put on top of the law. And there's weighing people down with rule upon rule and moral teaching and all this minute detail was just burdening people. And then there was the Herodians. They're like, we don't care. We're just going to be Greeks and Romans here. Like, live and let live. And so we don't want to push ourselves to either one of those extremes. So I start out there saying that I got a call from Emily McIntyre, who's one of our state representatives on Thursday afternoon. She was driving home from Salem. She's like, Mike, we need to pray on Monday. Or excuse me, we need to pray on Sunday for something that's happening Monday. They have a vote on Monday, and I know many of you are aware of this. It's House Bill 2002, and it is horrific. It is horrific. If I were to give you some of the lowlights, it's that they're going to allow abortion 
down to almost any age, like 10 years old, without any type of parental consent. Not, and not even parental consent, even parental notification. That means a 10-year-old can walk into their school resource center and get a pill or get an operation to remove a life from within her, and the mom or dad wouldn't even have to know about it. It also does things like remove any liability for doctors that perform or prescribe these operations or treatment. It allows state funding for people to come from out of state or out of country to go on like abortion tourism here, and we the taxpayers of Oregon are going to pay for it. Medicaid has to pay for it. Any health plan, any insurance plan in Oregon is required to pay for these things. On top of this horrendous abortion uh, uh, legislation, there's also the gender-affirming care that, that they're, they're pushing along with this. And now physicians are not going to be able to ever be held liable per, for performing gender-affirming care on our young people. That means someone might do something as a juvenile, and it could be done poorly or it could be done without good intent. And if they were to ever try to hold the pharmacist or the physician or the healthcare clinic responsible for what they did to them as a child, they couldn't even though massive studies are coming out of Europe right now showing this has serious, long-term harmful impacts on both young boys and young girls that choose to go that route, like permanent sterilization and other things like that. And so we're going to take a moment, we're going to pray for this, that this does not pass, and it's going to take a miracle, right? I mean, but do we serve a God of miracles? Yeah. So we're going to pray. So if you guys would join me in praying against this legislation, Father God, you know... You know, you know the darkness that is going on uh, politically, legislatively, and just in the hearts and minds of people in Oregon. Lord, I pray that through an act of your just sovereignty, God, that you would cause this not to pass our state legislator. Lord, I thank you for godly men and godly women that are standing up against this. I pray that they would not grow weary of doing good. Lord, we just specifically pray in Jesus' name that this legislation would not pass and that the, the truth, the light of your truth would just invade this darkness and people would see it for what it is. Lord, in the event that it does pass, we also recognize you're sovereign in that and that you use evil people and evil scenarios and evil environments to still bring your gospel to light. So we praise you either way, but Lord, we pray specifically for the protection of the young people in our state that this would not pass. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, I, <laughs> heavy way to start off service, right? Uh, I, I want to live in everything I just said is completely true, and I stand behind it 100%. And yet, at the same time, we're going we're gonna to have a message and a, and, a, and a body of Scripture this morning that we have to live in some tension with that, okay? So we know, if I could give you a little bit, just like kind of catch you up to where we are. We're in Jesus' Passion Week. He's in Jerusalem. He's ridden in. He's denounced the Pharisees. He's, he's, uh, they, they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is clearly our Messiah. And he's been giving these tough teachings, these parables, and doing this Q&A, and really just chastising the religious leaders in Jerusalem and in Israel. And we are, here we are. We're still on Tuesday of his Passion Week. And he is going to unload both barrels on, on the religious leaders. Now, this is la Jesus' last public teaching ever while he's on earth. This is it. Now, he's going to have a discussion with just his disciples. He's going to be, like, questioned before the Sanhedrin. Th that's still going to happen. But as far as his public teaching, this is it. And I think this carries some weight because what would be the last thing that you would teach on if you had one more hour here on earth? It would be something pretty near and dear to your heart, Right? And if we said, this is the last thing you talked about, and you used the harshest words ever to talk about it, what do you think that would be? Well, I can tell you, Jesus would have had plenty of opportunity to go after certain people at this point. He could have gone after the murderous Romans that were currently just stringing Jews up on crosses. He could have gone after the Samaritans, specifically some Samaritan women he knew that were just like, just steeped in sexual sin. Could have gone after them, he didn't. He could have gone after the woman that he met in adultery. Could have gone out for other women or men in adultery. But he didn't. He knew plenty of tax collectors from Matthew to Zacchaeus. He could have talked about their evil, cheating, just manipulative ways. He, could, he, he didn't. I'm sure there was an L, a B, a G, a D, and a Q, and a, a squiggly sign over some other letter that I don't know. Like, he could have gone after that crowd. 
and he didn't. He didn't go after the Gentiles. You know who he went after? People that look like us. He went after the religious people. The people that knew the right answers. That dressed the right way. The ones that had a Torah under their arm. So, as much as I want to come against, and, and I, I don't want to let up one bit on House Bill 2002 and things like that, that's not where Jesus would have spent his last moments on earth. He would have spent his last moments on earth in crowds that look like this, with the harshest words declared to people that look like me. So I don't want to miss that as we discuss this this morning. And I, I don't want to think we have to give up on one to accept the other. I, don't want, I want to be able to say, yeah, I think the harshest words, the last teaching, the most, the most vicious attacks were against people like me, but don't think I'm going to let go of the fact that Jesus hates sin. And he hates lies. And we're not taking chapter 23 and saying this is all of God's word. No, we're going to take the whole book as the full counsel of God. <clears throat> With that, let's get into it. Verses 1 through 4. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not, are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So Jesus says to the crowds and disciples, This is, this is not what it's about. It's not about academic pursuit. And it's not about legalistic righteousness. So he's talking about Moses' seat. He's saying, yeah, these are the ones that, just like Moses, they're the ones that give the law. They explain the law. But don't you dare do what they do. (laughs) You've heard the saying, do do what I say, not what I do. Jesus Jesus is basically saying that. Do what they say. They they actually, they are the ones that bear the Torah. And and they know it actually really well. See, the, the theology, the doctrine of the Sadducees was probably the closest to Jesus of any group at this time. Way closer than the Sadducees or the Herodians or the Essences, people like that. See, they believed in the afterlife. They believed in the whole council of the Old Testament. They had actually decent theology. It's their practice that was rotten. See, and then he goes on. He says, and don't, don't man, they, they burden people, but they will not lift a single burden. What they were doing was they were taking, here's, here's the law. And here's our oral tradition and more oral tradition. We're just going to lay all this on you. And they didn't have any differentiation between just the Old Testament plus all the oral law. And the oral law was so encumbering. It was so heavy. They're laying it on people. It's like like this. If I can kind of paint a picture of how we should think about this appropriately. Uh, I took, I think it was two weeks ago, I took a week off. And some good friends and I, we went to the Grand Canyon and we hiked the Grand Canyon for two days. We hiked across and then we hiked back the next day. It was awesome. It was beautiful, but to do that, you had to carry all your own gear. There was nothing for two days. And so what I think an appropriate way of thinking about this is, is when you go on a trip like that, you're going to have to carry certain supplies. You need a backpack. You need a headlamp. You need a certain bit of food and a sleeping bag. See, there's, there's things that you need to find your way and to protect you from the elements and to nourish your body that you have to have. Those things are not a burden. They're a necessity. That's like saying God's God's word, we're going to carry this with us. Not because this is a burden, because it's a necessity. It protects us. It guides us. It nourishes us. The world would say it's a burden. I'm going to say this is a guide. This is a headlamp. This is food. This is protection. The world's going to say it's a burden. But here's where the Pharisees went too far. They said, oh yeah, for your trip, Mike, you're also going to need like this giant Wi-Fi speaker to play music while you're down there. And by the way, you know, you're going to need a grizzly bear fence, so here's a car battery and a bunch of electric fence wire. To put. Well, they don't have grizzly bears in the Grand Canyon. All right? So the, the, the Pharisees are saying, oh, you need this too, and you better carry this. You're going to need some of that. And they're just weighing people down far beyond what was in the actual word of God. We can't do that. They're chastised for that because they're making people's load so heavy they couldn't bear it. So far beyond just what was in the word. Jesus is not saying don't carry the word. He's saying don't go beyond what the word tells us to carry. Five through seven. Everything they do is done for men to see. 
They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have men call them rabbis. The, uh, the Pharisees loved their image, but they cared nothing for inner transformation. Phylacteries, uh, this is going back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We read it last week where it talked about the Shema, this, this holy prayer that the Jews would pray. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, your soul, and your spirit. And then it goes on. And it would tell them to, to bind this word on their forehands and on their wrists. And so that's what they did. They took that quite literally and they would make little me, uh, uh, leather pouches or boxes and they would put it on their forehead, literally. And then they would also put it on their left hand and they would, they would put scripture in these little pouches around their left wrist. So they took this very literally. But understand when we actually read back in Deuteronomy, this is what it says. It says, tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads. But prior to that, it says, but these are, to be a, these are to be a symbol to be upon your heart. It wasn't how big your phylacteries could be. It wasn't how much scripture you could stuff into a little box on your forehead. It was meant to be a symbol of the heart transformation the word had within you. It was symbolic of how you think and how you act and what you do being an indicative of what was really important. And yet, there was no concern for their heart. They just wanted to buy a giant storage box on their forehead so everyone could see it. Oh, look at him. Look at her. Look, look, look how holy they are. Look at that phylactery. <laughs> the tassels, even Jesus wore tassels, but they were blue and white tassels, and they'd come off at each corner of the garment. This goes back to numbers, and it was done to remember God's commands. This was, this was commanded the Israelites, so they would remember God's commands. The problem is they had the tassels. The Pharisees knew the commands. But again, this was all done outwardly for men to see. There was no heart transformation. <clears throat> it talks about positioning at certain events, synagogues, banquets. We know what this is like still to our day, right? Have you guys ever been to a wedding? And when you go to the wedding, typically the front two rows or maybe the, the, the first two rows on each side, they're reserved, right, for like the parents of the bride and the groom, maybe extended family of the bride and the groom. Those have positions of honor and, 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 and like their closeness to the couple that are getting married. That's, that's like a show of honor. That's fine. Have you ever been to a church service where you have like the elders all sitting up here? You guys ever been there? Maybe you got certain people that, that were the big tithers that month, and, and they're, they got certain seats. To, like, there's still places that do this. Jesus is saying, man, when it comes to my family, my people, you don't do that stuff. It's not what it's about. We're not here to put hierarchy between men. Man, the worship, the glory, that all comes to Jesus. It's not due to men. <clears throat> Eight through ten. But you're not called to be, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. Man. What is Jesus saying here? You can't call someone father? Is that really the case? Can't tell someone, teacher, rabbi? What? Like, this is probably, I think, one of the more confusing parts of this entire passage of Scripture. Let, let's, let's talk about these terms in Greek culture, in Greek, Greek language back in Hebrew culture. Rabbi. The, the purpose of calling someone's rabbi is because you would actually want to be like that rabbi or even become a rabbi yourself. See, a disciple of a rabbi in those days, the, the intent was that you're going to become a rabbi and then you'll have followers behind you. That, that was the tri traditional rabbinical system of that time. Jesus is saying, you have one rabbi, that's me. You guys are not going to replace me after I leave. You are going to be my disciples all the time. You don't get to take on this position where, where, you, where you're going to make disciples that are trying to be like you. As we make disciples, it's always with the goal of being more like Christ. Like I, I am not trying to hear, trying, and praise the Lord I'm not, to make people like Mike Bull. That would turn into a train wreck. I would love to make disciples for Jesus Christ, though. The next one, Father. 
clearly because of Jesus' other teachings in Matthew. Uh, If you want to write it down, uh, chapter 15, verse 4, chapter 19, 19, other teachings by Paul. Like, using the word father for a biological father is totally fine. Like, if you are sweating that, like, oh, no, I call him father. I got to go to Papa or something now. Nope, you're, you're good. What Jesus has in mind here of people that were usurping the authority of God for calling a man, a teacher, a Pharisee, father. That's what's in view. It's not a biological designation. It's saying you don't get to call someone father because God is your father. <clears throat> the understanding is biblically that, that we're all brothers and sisters here. Like the family of God is, is we are siblings and we have one father who is God in heaven. And so what Jesus is making an, uh, a point here is that there is equality within the family of God. Now, is there also different roles that we play? Yeah, there is. But he's, he's making a point like we don't have extra value or worth because you're a teacher. Man, if, 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 the, if the church, the big C church, could, could have practiced this a little better over the last 2,000 years, things would have been much more healthy. The last one, teacher. This word teacher in the Greek, this is the only place this is used in the entire New Testament. This is not teacher like a school teacher or teacher even like a teacher of the law. This is teacher like the, the word here, they find it in other Greek text, never in the New Testament. It's, it's more like private tutor. You don't get to call someone your private tutor. Here's why. <clears throat> no one should have unchecked authority to be your private spiritual leader, counselor, or advocate. No one should have unchecked authority to be your private spiritual leader, teacher, advocate. Jesus is our prophet, priest, and king. Not me. Not anybody else that gets unchecked spiritual authority into your life. That's the concept in view here. If you want to think about this little section here, it's that titles are given, titles should not be given to exalt, rather just to designate. So the titles they were giving were lifting people up out of an equality to a hierarchy and say, you get to dominate rather than be part of a family. 11 and 12, Jesus is going to wrap up this little section right here. The greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, the Sadducees, just like today's age. They were trying to, to increase their own power and authority and that true kingdom leadership looks like giving your power and authority to others. Using whatever resources you have, whatever that looks like, maybe it's your intellect, maybe it's your time, maybe it's your money, maybe it's your energy, whatever you have, you're gonna use that for the kingdom by raising other people up, not by pushing others down to raise yourself up. Isn't this countercultural? I mean, it was countercultural 2,000 years ago. It's countercultural today. It's countercultural to my own heart. Like every day when, when, when Paul talks about doing the things he doesn't want to do and not doing the, do the, doing the things he does want to do in Romans 7, like this, is the, this works in my life every day like this. That there is an innate desire to do this on the heads of people around me. And Jesus says, no, no you do this. <laughs> That's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. We're going to keep going in verses 13 through 36. I'm going to take these one by one, but these are the seven woe sections towards the Pharisee. This word woe in the Greek, it's kind of twofold. It's one, both a pouring out of wrath and a sorrowful lament. Now, to get a picture of what this would probably look like is when I was just discussing this House bill about abortion and gender-affirming care, the lack of accountability for medical professionals, how we can do this to young kids, there, I would hope and I would trust that many of you felt both a mixture of wrath and lament. Both makes you want to fight and want to cry at the same time. That's, that's the woe Jesus is talking to, to, uh, about here. Woe unto you, you hypocrites. It's like you actors. You two-face. You, you people that, that put on a show, you dress up and pretend. You pretend religion. And it makes Jesus both want to punch him in the face and cry at the same time. Verse 13. 
Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces, and you yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying. The Pharisees were door shutters. You guys know door openers? I'm not talking about like polite young men that go around and helping old ladies. I'm talking about people that spend their life trying to create opportunities for other people. Maybe it's job opportunities or educational opportunities. Hopefully it's spiritual opportunities. You're trying to open the door for people. Man, that's a beautiful thing. Man, he's not here today. My father-in-law is so good at this. Like he just loves introducing people that can help and benefit from one another. He does it like naturally. It doesn't matter if it's jobs or education or just like both liking certain sports or activities. Oh, you like this? You like, oh, I should, I should introduce you guys. You, yeah, yeah, oh, you're interested in this and, you, and you have a, you're an employer over there and you want, you're looking for a job. Man, I want to introduce you. Like he's just a door opener. He does it so like spontaneously and organically. I want to be like that for the kingdom of God. I want to be a door opener. Do you know Jesus? Man, you're talking about works a lot. Do you know about grace? Do you know about the gospel? Like, oh, you're talking about evolution a lot. Like, you're talking about just coming from, from primates stuff. Like, man, have I talked to you about intelligent design? Let's talk about, like, can we be door openers? The Pharisees were not. They were door shutters. You're not good enough, not smart enough. Don't have the right works, not dressed the right way. Slamming door, slamming door, slamming. Man, we need to be door openers. Verse 15, woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Makers of children bound to hell. Gah. Talk about just slamming people. Like these are, str- these are fighting words. You makers of children bound to hell. If you guys have ever been around a recent convert, to anything. Convert to CrossFit, convert to Christianity, convert to a new town of iPhone if they switch from Android. Like they're passionate about it, right? They're excited about this new thing. Converts are excited. That's a beautiful thing about new Christians is they're just like stoked to go out and storm the gates of hell. I love that. Jesus understands the Pharisees were making converts too. And they were just as zealous to go make a bunch of works-based righteousness, hypocritical, self-righteous people as they were. It's like, don't do that. Don't make that kind of convert. You're making children bound for hell. 16 through 22. Woe to you, blind guides. You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men. Which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. You ever know people that just get caught up on semantics? And attorneys are great at this. I don't know if you ever, like, there's some attorneys that I love. This is not casting like a totally wide net here, but you could go to attorneys and be like, hey, I really want to represent this, but I always want to be able to do this. Write me like a 100-page contract where I could do that. Write me a contract where I could make someone think I want to do this, but then because of the fine print, I can get around them and and, and do this. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They They were arguing semantics. Is it the gold or the temple or the altar or the sacrifice? And if you if you swear by this, well, then you can break your word and it's no big deal. And if you swear by that, well, yeah, you're you're kind of bound. I mean, honesty meant nothing to them. A heart of integrity meant nothing to them. They were just all about how you can get around these certain things. And we have to be people who, one, we recognize the own intent of our heart, and we recognize the intent and the heart of others. And Becky was telling me just recently about this little kiddo that came to her. Just like, recognize the sweetness of this. I want, she said, this little kiddo, this little girl said, I want Jesus in my heart. Praise the Lord, right? Now, here's what a Pharisee does. Well, little girl, actually, he doesn't come into your heart. The Holy Spirit does. So you need to work on your theology a little bit. And also, it's not your actual heart. I mean, that, that's, just, that's just a thing that's pumping your chest. This is more symbolic of your soul and mind and your will. So I think you need to rephrase that. I need you to go home. Like, we don't say that to little kids. That'd be so discouraging and stupid. 
And you recognize that their heart is soft to the Holy Spirit's leading them towards Jesus as their king. You welcome that. We don't get caught up in the, well, you know, you know the fine print says. Like, like, there's a place for good theology. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we have to remit, recognize when a heart is hungry for Jesus. You don't discourage that. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. 23 and 24. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. I want you guys just to imagine the legalism of going out to your little veggie garden this summer, right? And you've got something coming up. I don't know if it's going to be dill or cumin or mint or whatever. You got some basil or we got asparagus coming up. And you pick some to take in for dinner, right? Let's say you pick a little bit of, uh, I don't know, rosemary to go put, some, put in some sauce or something. And, and you've got a little bunch of it. Well, here's what the Pharisees do. Well, I'm going to take one out of every 10 little sprigs. I'm going to set it aside. And I'm going to take that down to the temple. And I'm going to tell all my buddies about it. Hey, here's, here's I am so holy that I brought this one little bit of leaf because I used nine others over there for my pasta sauce. And so I'm going to give this, like, they're straining out that gnat. Meanwhile, they're stepping on the beggar's head to get there. They lack justice, they lack mercy, they lack faithfulness. They don't care about the people that are being wronged. They won't provide mercy to the people that are wrong, and they're not being faithful to God, but they got their little bit of dill. Man, no wonder they're called blind guides. And yet, we'll get, we'll get to the more of the application here. Like, Mike Bull does the same thing. 25 and 26. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the ditch, and then the outside will be clean as well. <clears throat> I, I can only imagine the Pharisees were a pretty good-looking crowd. I don't think they invited a lot of people that had physical, mental deformities or inadequacies. I'm guessing most of them like, looked like pretty put-together people. They had to be by the way they dressed. I'm sure they were fairly well-fed compared to the average Palestinian person at that time. I'm sure they, they had to keep clean clothes for the right purity laws, and they would wash their hands just right. I'm sure they had oil in their hair and all that. And Man, don't we... Don't we, like, isn't this, the human heart does not change. How many people do we know on social media, right, that just have the most glamorous life ever? Like, they've got the perfect argument and presentation on every Twitter feed. They've got the perfect little family, life, body, coffee cup, whatever on Instagram. They've got, like, the perfect little cat meme on Facebook. I don't, I don't know what else is on Facebook. But, that, but, like, whatever your thing is, like, it looks so perfect, and their life is in shambles. They're physically ill. They're relationally like bankrupt, spiritually poor. And yet you look on social media, it's like, wow, I want to be like that. And, and they actually stir up some level of like jealousy and conceit just by, look, I want that. Meanwhile, they're just ridden with relational, spiritual, or health cancer. But it doesn't look like that. Man, from the outside looking in, they got a pretty sweet life. I know people like this. I know people that are relationally bankrupt and they have more followers than I can count. I, I I'm, not, I'm not just saying this. I really know people like this. And, 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 and on their Insta, they have over 100,000 people that, that follow their everyday life and what they do. 100,000 people every day watch what they do, how they get ready, what they eat. I'm not joking. And they are lonely people. They're lonely. And they're beautiful people. I mean, they're beautiful on, on, on the screen. And they really are. And they're actually quite beautiful in real life. And they think they're ugly. Like they're, they're bankrupt. But they spend all this time, just like these Pharisees, cleaning up the outside of the cup and the dish. And it looks so good. And inside, it's just rotten. Man, we, that's not what we're called to be. 27, 28. 
Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. It's kind of a continuation from the woe before that, but what they would do is they'd take this white chalk and they'd go around and they would beautify tombs. And it was one so that they would, they would honor their, their dead ancestors, but it would also be, it would look quite beautiful. I don't, I don't know why a whitewashed tomb looks beautiful, but that was the thing then. And it was also done so people would recognize that it was a tomb and they wouldn't walk over it or near it across it because then they would be ceremonially unclean for seven more days. So this was like a really popular practice around Jerusalem because as people would come there to celebrate Passover, man, you would not want to step on a tomb and therefore be ceremonially unclean, kept out of the temple and the city. So it was a big deal that you would recognize tombs and these tombs would just be beautiful. And people would do all these ornate, like white colorings around tombs. Yet inside, it's just dead men's bones. And for a Jew, that was super unclean. You couldn't even go near it without having to separate yourself from the community for seven days. That's what Jesus is calling these people. If I could put this in a little bit more of today's terms. <laughs> I know Botox is big in some areas. It's, it actually doesn't seem to that big, at least popular in Eagle Point. But it's like giving Botox to a corpse. It's like, it's like dressing up something that's already dead and gone just to make it look good. Can you imagine doing that? No. You know, that's what the Pharisees are doing. That's what their life is like. They're like a plastic surgeon going to town on a corpse. It's dead. It's gone. The Pharisees are dead. They're spiritually corpses. They're gone. And yet they still spend all this time trying to beautify themselves and their lives and their practices. It was morbid. It was spiritually a morbid way to live. <clears throat> Keep going. 29 through 32 this is the last of the woes. But they had hearts of murder. 29, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. And so these men, they would go and they would build monuments they built monuments to the prophets that their forefathers killed, saying, oh, these were holy men. They should have never been killed. And at the same time, they're devising how to kill Jesus. At the same time, they're trying to fund the monuments to prophets. They're trying to figure out how they can kill the Son of God, the prophet that was in their midst. Man, the hypocrisy, the murder that is currently stewing in their heart they don't even see while they're trying to honor the prophets that were murdered before them. They were blind to their own wickedness. They were blind to the lives they were living. The culmination of the judgments in 33 through 36. <clears throat> you snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. Whew. And he is not letting off the gas here. You snakes, you brood of vipers. Have we heard that before? I want, I want to think of that term as like bookends on Jesus' proclamation of the king and the kingdom. If we went back to Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist says the same thing. You brood of vipers, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And now on Jesus' final teaching, you brood of vipers, you missed it. This is your last opportunity. Turn, repent. The king, the king and the kingdom are here. If we could summarize the book of Matthew, this is it. The king is in your midst. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and receive it. And they're not. This is, this is like a bookend to Jesus' teaching. It started with repent, you vipers, you snakes, and Jesus is ending that same way. This is a last opportunity. 
He tells them what's going to happen prophetically. He says, I'm going to send you prophets and wise men and teachers, and some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues. We know from the book of Acts, as well as other outside biblical sources, this is exactly what happens. From Stephen to Paul to John to all, all 11 of the disciples that go forth. Man, this is what happens. They're beaten. They're flogged. They're killed. They're crucified. The culmination of all the judgments that's been stored up from all the righteous blood that's been shed, all the way from Abel to Zechariah, Jesus says, is going to come upon this generation. And we'll get into this more next week, but the kind of condemnation that came down and the kind of atrocities that happened about 40 years after this in 70 AD by by Titus, the Roman commander, and what they did in Jerusalem, we're going to get into that a little bit more next week. It was horrific. By all accounts, 1.1 million people in Jerusalem were killed in 70 AD. There were no survivors. Of the people left in Jerusalem, those that did not flee, everybody died. And all the righteous blood from Abel to Zechariah, the condemnation came due on that generation. He concludes in 37 through 39, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, You who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate, left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Ah. He could be this imagery, this, and he wanted to gather his people together, his, his, the children together under the wings of a hen. That's Old Testament energy. God talks about a lot of, in the Psalms, especially about covering his people by, by his wings. It's a refuge, it's a protection, it's a shelter. And Jesus says, man, I came specifically to these people at this time. These are my people. These are who I came to, the lost sheep of Israel. I came to gather them, to protect them, and they're rejecting me. They're, they're going to kill me. They want nothing to do with me as their king or my kingdom that I'm offering them. And you, I, I, I hope you can just like hear the pain, the anguish in Jesus' words here. This was not cheering like, woohoo, judgment's going to come now. This is Jesus lamenting for his people. <clears throat> Jesus quotes here Psalms 118 verse 26, and we've, we've read this recently. This is the psalm that was shouted as he came into Jerusalem. Hosanna, blessed is he who's come in the name of the Lord. Save us. Jesus is saying this. He's saying, you're going to hear that again. Oh, you're going to hear that again. When I return, this will be the cry of every human being on the planet. Some will be a cry of joy and others will be a cry of anguish, anguish. But when I come again, there will not be a knee that does not bow and recognize me as the king. He is coming back. And when he does, we will all cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Everyone will say that. The question is, will you say it in sorrow or say it in joy? Are you saying it because he is the king taking you to his kingdom or he is casting you off into eternal damnation? Whew, that doesn't sound good. But that's the reality. I think we need to just be real about that. This is, this is, the the question is whether we're shouting, blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord. Are we shouting it in joy? It's because we're his people. Our names are written in the book of life. Our sins have been forgiven. We go on to eternal life with our king. It's gonna be amazing. But the option is not neutral then. The option is eternity damned to hell where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die, according to Jesus. That's a stark contrast. Let's just live with the weight of that. As I mentioned, I think when I first started... This message, this is not a message I would give. <laughs> because this opens up some things in my own heart that are just not pretty. And if I have a certain bent towards a, or a persuasion in my life that is of the flesh and of my own sin, it is towards a Pharisee. I have no doubt if I was living 2,000 years ago, I would have been a Pharisee. It's, it's the way my mind and my heart operate. And so I actually, man, as sometimes I feel like when I'm studying for a message, like, 
it's, it's fairly easy to come up with some practical application. How do we take uh, uh, words that were written 2,000 years ago to a different people group, but they're for us, written not to us, but for us, and I feel like I can find some decent application. And this, I'm just like, Lord, I just feel like cut open. <laughs> and so what I'm going to read to you, this is, this is not from me, but this is from other people way smarter. Um, I think it's important to remember that it is easy to look at other people and, and claim like 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 kind of sin. And it's easy to talk about that. I'm going to read that because, because that is God's word. That is Jesus' words just as much as Matthew, Matthew 23 is. I'm going to read it here. Neither the sexually immoral nor the idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That is God's word. That is truth. I'm not backing off that. I'm just saying that in this context, it's easy to focus on that stuff. And as, as we've come to Christ, as, as we come to Christ, we become more like Christ, oftentimes it's easy to trade those sins for more pharisaical sins. It's easy to trade adultery for pride. It's easy to trade being a swindler or a drunk for self-righteousness. And those are much more difficult to spot. It's like trading in smoking for chewing. It's like, one's not better than the other, y'all. But you can hide one a lot better than the other. You don't reek and stink everywhere you go somewhere. You can just spit it out. And as long as you get it out of your teeth, no one will know. Right? Right? doesn't make it better. And that's what it's like being a Pharisee sometimes. If, when Pharisees come to Christ, man, maybe, maybe we give up some of this 1 Corinthians stuff, which we should, that sinful, nasty stuff. It's baggage that we got to get rid of. And yet oftentimes we trade that out for Pharisaical stuff. Being a hypocrite, being self-righteous, being a legalist, counting our deal, but stepping on the head of the beggar to go turn it in. That's the kind of people Jesus has the strongest, you brood of vipers, you snakes, woe unto you, you hypocrites. He did not say that to the Samaritan woman. He didn't say it to the tax collector or the Roman centurions. <clears throat> Here's maybe some symptoms of being a Pharisee. Pharisees count everything. They count attendance, they count tithes, they count the minutes spent Bible reading, the minutes of prayer, length of skirts, the heights of hand raised in worship, the breadth of Bible knowledge and the depth of theological insight while they pay no attention to a heart being transformed. People know more about what you're against than what you're for. You think God needs you. God doesn't need any of us. They don't publicly repent and ask for forgiveness because they have serious sin to deal with. They think Bible reading is to reinforce doctrinal, a doctrinal skeleton, but they never give their heart a spiritual EKG. They think Christian community is about proving who knows more rather than encouraging, bearing one another's burdens and confessing sin. They think that being fishers of men entails cleaning the fish and then deciding if you want to catch them. <laughs> Tim Keller in his book, Prodigal God, wrote this about the American church. Thankfully, he didn't write it about our church, but I think we have some symptoms. <clears throat> he says, we tend to draw conservative, button-down, moralistic people. The licentious and the liberated the broken and the marginalized avoid church. That can only mean one thing. If the preaching of our ministers and the practice of our parishioners do not have the same effect on people that Jesus had, then we must not be declaring the same message that Jesus did. And I would add to that, or it's preached with a vastly different heart. John Fisher wrote a book called The 12 Steps for a Recovering Pharisee, and here's the top three 12 steps. If I'm being honest, these convicted me, every single one. Admit that your single most unmitigated pleasure is to judge other people. Believe our means to achieving greatness is making others lower. 
we detest, or at least troubled by, people being given mercy who didn't, unlike us, work for it and deserve it. So is there hope for recovering Pharisees? I think the Bible points to two, both Nicodemus and Paul. Nicodemus was the, the Pharisee in John 3 that came to Jesus. It's who Jesus spoke that, that uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus told that to a Pharisee. And then there's the Apostle Paul, who was a Pharisee. And yet he had a real and living and tangible encounter with Jesus, and he turned his entire life around. It's not that Jesus doesn't want the Pharisee. Jesus wants the Pharisees and the prostitutes. He wants the Sadducees and the tax collectors. It's not like one's better than the other, but there is a type of sin that gets ingrained in us that's much harder to spot. It's harder to hold one another accountable, and it's really easy just to push down and focus on all the inflammatory stuff around us. So what's the cure? I think it's simple. (laughs) Simple and yet so difficult. We focus less on ourselves and on others and on things and more on Jesus Christ. We make much of Jesus. We make little of ourselves. We judge people less. We think about things less. We think about Jesus Christ and who he is and what he did for us much, much more. Let's pray. Father God, I confess that I have some real pharisaical tendencies. And Lord, as I say they're tendencies, I'm really just trying to soft pedal the fact that they're sins. So Lord, I'll say, I have some pharisaical sin in my life. I'm thankful that you are faithful to forgive. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that would be far more concerned with the two-by-fours in our eyes than the splinters in those outside here. Lord, may we be a people that love in the way you loved People that greet with open arms and open hearts, recognizing that we didn't merit our own salvation. Lord, may we be people that don't swing too far and forget about sin and speak truth. Lord, may we find the balance that is only found in you of speaking truth in love. Lord, I pray for me personally and anyone else here, if there is pharisaical sin in our life that you would just expose and root that out within us. In your heavenly name, amen. Please stand in honor and worship of Jesus. When the music fades All is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus less worth no one could express how much you deserve though I'm weak and poor all I have is yours every single breath I'll bring you more than a song for a 
your song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus.
ashamed of what I've done, what I've become. These hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the whole. You plead my cause, you right my wrongs, you break my chains, you overcome, you gave your life to give me mine, you say that I am free, how can it be, yeah, how can Jesus, we praise you that it can be, that because you are so good and you are so powerful, you save sinners like us. We praise you for that, Jesus, in your name, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have an awesome week. Amen.